Hello and welcome to Genetics 101, Unraveling the BFRB Code on this thoughtful Thursday of BFRB Awareness Week 2022. I'm Jen Monteleone, Interim Executive Director, the TLC Foundation for Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors. Some quick housekeeping items before we get started. This is an educational webinar offered in a safe and welcoming for everyone attending today. Questions for our guests should be asked through the Q&A feature, and your questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. If you have any tech challenges during the webinar, please use the chat box to message one of our TLC staff members, and we will be happy to help you. Our guests today are experts in the field of BFRBs, Dr. Jeremiah Scharf and Dr. John Passantini. They're here today to share more about genetics and the work that's being done through TLC's BPM project. Please help me welcome Dr. Jeremiah Scharf and Dr. John Passantini. Hello. Hello. Thank you both for being here today. I'm going to go off camera now and I'll see you back for wrap up. Sounds good. All right. So let's go here. Why BFRB genetics? Um, as, I, as I was uh, uh, starting to say, uh, we, know, uh, we know that BFRBs can be familial and highly familial. In an early study, uh, suggested that 75% of the uh, familiality in uh, an early uh, uh, hair pulling twin study suggested that there, that seventy five percent of the contributions of hair of hair pulling appeared to be genetic. Um, subsequent studies looking uh, at families uh, suggested that five to eight percent of first degree relatives, so siblings or parents or children of individuals who had HPD, would have HPD, um, and that uh, is compared to only uh, what we now expect to be one percent in the general population. Um, genetics, I think one of the most important parts is that genetics offers an unbiased way to identify the underlying biology of conditions, um, which provides an opportunity to develop a uh, new understanding, uh, particularly for brain-based conditions, and also to develop uh, new treatments or to refine existing treatments. Um, and in addition, uh, BFRBs can leverage data um, from genetic studies, uh, studies of conditions uh, that may uh, currently have um, larger existing genetic information um, and are thought to co-occur with BFRBs. So um, in many cases, you can use other conditions that have uh, at this point had uh, more available uh, government funding to sort of pull along. Um, and use that to leverage information about the FRBs. Okay, so when most of us think about something that's genetic, um, and that's how I really mostly would have thought about this before 2005, um, is what we call a single gene disorder, or since scientists always have to put things in either Greek or Latin, what we call monogenic single gene. And uh, th this is considered Mendelian because uh, Gregor Mendel, who uh, was looking at his peas, uh, realized that, that there were certain patterns uh, that would involve single genes changing from one pea plant to uh, its daughter uh, pea plant. Um, and when we see, uh, what we see for single gene disorders, particularly for ones that, uh, that run in uh, with a single gene where each a child has a 50-50 chance of getting a condition, we see exactly uh, the pattern that we're looking at here, which is, can you, uh, can you guys see an arrow here is it, um, uh, yes. that I'm circling or not necessarily? Yes. Okay, great. So if we look uh, in, in the filled in circles, these are, uh, so this person at the top here uh, looks like great grandparents. Um, has three children, all who seem to have uh, this condition. And in this case, it's Huntington's uh, Korea. And, um, and then they have their own children and looks like one, two, three, four, five, six of the grandchildren have 
this condition and one, two, three, four, five, six do not. So it's literally 50-50. And that's uh, what we see on average for, for what we call a single gene uh, dominant trait. We have a 50% chance of, of getting a condition. Um, oh, and there we are. So, the, so not only is that how it's inherited, but if a sibling has the disease and this is autosomal dominant, that means that each additional sibling also has a 50% chance of having this condition. And this is how they've uh, uh, most of the original uh, genes uh, for diseases have been identified. But what we've learned, particularly for uh, many brain-based traits um, that are more common than, so, than Huntington's disease, which is actually present in only one in 10,000 individuals. Um, but this is a, a, a typical pedigree of a family which has BFRBs running in the family. And what we actually see here is that although the way this, this family was originally identified, where there is a great grand uh, mother who may have had hair pulling, and there are 50%, uh, then there is a child here. Now, this child actually has a different BFRB that's nail biting, and then this child has an, a different one. Um, and then we sort of sometimes see it running through, a, through branches of the family, and other times we don't. And this is much more, uh, this is consistent. So ah, I could have just pressed the next, next slide. Um, and you can see here are the individuals that have the condition and it actually looks up front like it might be this 50-50 situation. But the first thing we notice is, huh, people actually have different presentations. Um, and then uh, uh, when we go uh, to look further, we recognize that in other disorders, when we start looking at, at the rates of um, how these are passed down, they don't have the typical 50% uh, inheritance uh, from a, a parent to uh, a child. And we can, and also looking at, uh, at twins, um, we don't see what we would expect if, if, gene were, if a single gene was only explained everything about the disease. Now, the example I am giving here, you, as you will see, is for schizophrenia. And that is not because um, that in itself has anything uh, directly related to the genetics of BFRBs. It's just that it is the condition that has had probably the most funding uh, and most people involved in research for what we would call a behavioral trait or a neuropsychiatric trait. And so there has been work that's been done since the 1990s in huge populations. So we know um, the, the familiarity of that um, much better. And uh, what we know is that uh, if you have two identical twins, so those are two twins who actually uh, have I, essentially 100% of their DNA um, is the same, um, if those two twins, uh, you follow them into their 20s, only about 40% of the time would you find that both of them either have schizophrenia, uh, have schizophrenia when there's schizophrenia running in the family. While if they really have identical DNA and it was really one uh, DNA change, what we call autosomal dominant, you would actually expect that 100% of the time that should be the case. Now you look at fraternal twins who share 25% of their DNA. Ah. Um, so since they don't share 100%, this is not a single gene inheritance. And then when we look at fraternal twins or siblings, we would expect that 20 to 25% of siblings should have the same condition, and they don't. Um, it's actually really somewhere between 10% or lower if one person has schizophrenia that the other person in the family will. That's still significantly elevated over a 1% risk in the general population or it, it looking at a reference spouse. So there is a genetic effect, but it's not a single gene effect. So Jeremiah, if, um, just, if I understand this correctly, you would expect yep. to have the same genes and you have the same risk genes that you would be identical in terms of the disorders that you have. But not only do, does the proportion of, of, of individuals with the gene 
lower than what you would expect by math for actually having the disorder, but in some cases it's a lot lower. So That's just right. having the gene doesn't mean you have the disorder. It sounds like it's a lot more complicated, even if there's one, one dominant gene that should carry significant risk for the disorder. So it's more complicated than just your parents now have the gene and you have the disorder. That's not necessarily what right. it's about. Is that correct? That, that's exactly right. You've got, thank you. You've got it exactly right. And the reason for this is that we now realize that, um, you know, we have, uh, we have 23 chromosomes and sex chromosomes and those are all working together to at least lay out some sort of blueprint for uh, for certain processes in our in our bodies, and then we all grow and develop in different places, you know, in different ways. A lot of it just by chance. Some of it, uh, uh, you know, it, it by by some genetic background. And in fact, it's our whole genome um, that is laying a blueprint. And really, we've learned more and more that it is quite unusual for something, even things that are that are highly familial or highly genetic, to always occur exactly the same way in a person who has the different, uh, different uh, presentations. So even with the same genes. And, that's, and even in some cases, the parents may not have a BFRB, but the kids do. That's exactly right. So it can work both ways, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. Or the exact opposite way, both parents could have BFRBs and the child might not at all, right? So we know it's an increased risk, but it is not a uh, definitive. So uh, a, a really uh, important study that was done about eight years ago uh, in the UK, these were looking at 5,000, so 5,400 twins who uh, agreed to be evaluated, filled out forms uh, for uh, OCD and related disorders. And this, is, this included information about OCD itself, about a condition called body dysmorphic disorder, about hair pulling, skin picking, and hoarding. They just looked at those five. And then they did uh, and saw, marked which of, the, which of the twins, each of the twins and across twins, had each of these five, and then they did some very complicated um, mathematical uh, relationships uh, analyses. And, but basically they're comparing the identical twins to the fraternal twins and try to understand um, how are these five OC and related disorder uh, conditions uh, related in terms of genetics. And they came up with some really interesting information, and this is a lot. But, let, but I'm hoping I can, I can just point out the, uh, the key parts. So what they found is, first of all, there are both uh, genetic and non-genetic factors. I want to make it really clear that in the world of genetics, when there are things that are non-genetic, they use the word environmental. Environmental does not mean what actually I would think environmental means, and many of you probably would, that there's something in the environment like smog or something you ate or some other type of thing that, um, uh, that caused you to have a condition. It really mostly means non-genetic. Um, and then sometimes, uh, but there can be shared, closer shared genetic or environmental uh, commonalities, for example, people who are raised in the same household. Um, some other things that are environmental are things like just when you happen to go through puberty um, or, or uh, whether you had the opportunity to go to school. Um, and these, all of those things may influence, for example, how, uh, you know, how, in this case, how your brain grows. Um, but what they discovered actually is that across the five, these five um, OC related disorders, there is actually a significant component of genetics that's actually shared by all five of these OCRDs. This is the dark blue. I, sorry, can you, can you describe, I can see OCD. What are the other initials? 
So it's OCD, HD is hoarding disorder. The one in the middle is BDD, body dysmorphic disorder. And then there's TTM, trichotillomania and SPD, um, skin picking. So the two on the right are, are, are trichotillomania and skin picking, hair pulling disorder and skin picking disorder. And so there is shared genetics between, and therefore shared biology and shared risk between all five of these. Um, and it may also explain why there is uh, certainly a significant overlap between OCD and each of these other four. And therefore there's some underlying biology between them. But then there are even more so um, genetic uh, disease specific genetics, particularly for body dysmorphic disorder, almost over 60% is unique to BDD. And maybe about 50% of hoarding has its own factors and OCD about 20%. But if you look at hair pulling and skin picking, what they found was that even though there's a component uh, that's shared with the other OCRDs, there's actually a huge set of factors that are actually shared within the two BFRBs, which uh, is what led people to think besides the fact that anyone who has these conditions or any clinicians who work with people can recognize that, um, uh, that sometimes siblings might have hair pulling, some might have skin picking, some might have both, some might have neither. But there does seem to be something shared, uh, a significant sharing of risk for developing um, either condition or both. Um, and so that is why a lot of the research now is being done on hair pulling and skip pinking together and then subset analyses on the individual ones. So we can get, so that's that sort of helped why um, the current BPMI study design was designed to do analyses both together and then separately. Does that make sense? I'll take that maybe as a yes, or just I'm confused. So, but what do we need to know about this? One. Twin, twin studies suggest that BFRBs are genetic. However, because the rate and because the rates of BFRBs occurring in, in identical twins compared to non-identical twins, that actually suggests that there's a significant genetic component. But it's not all genetics because we're not talking about identical twins 100% of the time having a BFRB. Um, and also when you look at first degree relatives, those rates are not as high as you might expect for a single gene disorder. So genetics are important, but there are also non-genetic factors. And, um, and so it's going to take a decent amount of work to identify these factors, because we don't just have to look at two or three families and identify a gene. We have to understand um, what's actually going on across genes as well. But it also suggests that we can use data from other OCRDs um, to find help to understand and identify BFRB genes. Um, I think I may skip over this one because it's basically showing the same thing, um, which is that this is essentially, we think of genetics as being deterministic. And when we think about determinism, that's something like, Huntington's disease or Wilson's disease, where there's a single gene, you're gonna get the condition. But that means that your risk over the general population is in the thousands. But most of what we think of as genetic these days, particularly for, for many neurological and also what we call neuropsychiatric conditions are actually really more probabilistic. Bipolar disorder, OCD is a, is a good example, which is now uh, being studied more intensively. The family, a risk of some a family member has a condition is maybe five-fold higher, not 2,000-fold higher. So genetics are important, but in the most case, they are not deterministic. They don't tell you whether you have the condition. So why, why should we be looking? Um, so what do we think the inheritance is for BFRBs? They are genetic, but it's probably not a one-gene disorder in most families, except pop possibly in rare cases. And we can talk about that. It may be, though, that some people have only one or a few genes that are necessary in a family. 
um, but they may be different genes in each in different families, and there may be multiple genes, in fact, more likely in combination. Um, so um, how do we go about doing this? And what we've learned is we have to take different approaches to looking for this, to try to find genes in different ways. And, um, and actually, uh, there are different people in the scientific uh, community that are go going after this, uh, uh, both through BPMI um, and in other measures. So uh, I'll... What I want you to think about is think about our genome as a city. And if this is a city here that happens to be dominated by one huge feature that I think you likely re uh, recognize as the Eiffel Tower. And in this case, this represents a single gene that basically defines the disease. And that's what we usually, we have been traditionally taught about genetics. If you saw the Eiffel Tower, as long as, you know, it's not really small and on somebody's desk as a souvenir, you would think, yeah, I'm, I, I know where I am. I'm in Paris. And the example here is Huntington's disease. Um, but what people are now learning about Huntington's disease, for example, is that they are now finding additional genes that maybe identify this structure here. Um, uh, which is sacre coeur, and they can uh, find other things about the buildings there and learn much more and more about what interacts with the Huntington gene um, and, in fact, are learning about modifiers that may actually help them to develop new treatments. So even if the main, the main, uh, the main gene that causes the disease is Huntington, if you can learn everything about the, uh, other genes that are modifying Huntington, that's actually what people are looking for um, in addition to gene therapy, but actually looking for new treatments. On the other hand, um, you might get a, a disease like this. Um, and this is, a, this is a, a, we're looking at um, uh, a city that usually most people, uh, including me, didn't really know what it was. And this is the same example we were talking about, about polygenic, which are small effects. And this is, the best example is height. Um, in which very rarely, very, very rarely is somebody born suddenly very short. Most of the time, um, height is essentially uh, caused by hundreds or even a thousand genes, each that contribute to human height, such that each child is about halfway as tall between um, that of their mother and their father, plus some differences whether you're male or female and, how, and when you go through puberty. But if, as people have studied height, they could find many, many genes, and then that lets them learn more about the places where you are. And in fact, in this case, you could learn about these, these nice looking buildings and you could look at these spring uh, trees in the spring. And if you learn more about those, you might realize that these are brownstones in a Northeastern city um, and that actually you were in Boston, which you might never really gotten from just the bird's eye view. Um, and so it's not that you, 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 it's that you can't learn um, about the important genetics um, and identify new treatments by looking at these in different ways. Um, you basically just have to understand what, uh, how, how this condition is familial and genetic. So Jeremiah, so, I'm gonna put you on the spot just a little bit here. Yeah, and I know it's not, what you've been saying, if, if I understand it correctly, is that there are a lot of genes that contribute to um, hair pulling and skin picking. There may be some yeah. important ones, so maybe yeah. there's 20 story tall building instead of the Eiffel Tower, but there's yeah. no, there's no stat, Statue of Liberty or uh, Correct. anything like that. Um, so if, if BFRBs were a city, <laughs> which one might they be? So we still don't fully know, um, but just given what we have, given what we've seen about the uh, the familiality and honestly, what we know about most um, uh, most brain-based conditions, um, where uh, where people uh, are otherwise developing, typically, I would think it's going to be more like Boston and less like Paris. There, are, there certainly can be some genes that are going to be like Paris, and in fact. As I was alluding to, there is a junior faculty member um, at Yale University that many of uh, 
uh, many families may have um, interacted with when she was a trainee. Her name is uh, Dr. Emily Olson, and she is looking for these sort of genie uh, catching a uh, not genie in a bottle, a fly in a uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, you're trying to sort of capture uh, genetic changes happening uh, uh, the, from one generation to another, and then looking for um, these big effect gene changes. Um, and so she's actually um, has a, 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 an award to look for that in parallel to um, these ideas of looking across um, uh, everybody. And, um, and so I think these are gonna be interesting and valuable approaches. And the goal of both of the sets of approaches that are being used now is to really create the data sets and the information um, that will demonstrate to the NIH uh, that people are really ready, uh, at, that BFRBs are, uh, have the background evidence and data uh, for even you know additional large scale, um, you know, uh, funding over the years to narrow down those genes further. So that's that's sort of the way I think I would think about this. Uh, maybe I'll just jump jump through this. So what do we need to do to do this for BFRBs? Um, what ha what has been done? Um, you know, early on, what we really had we had about. Uh, you know, only I'd say 100 or 200 samples. Um, in the mid 2000s, there was the TRIC repository that was collected, but had about 200 BF, well characterized BFRB cases. Um, uh, there are the, actually, here at the, the BPMI samples that, you know, that are incredibly well characterized is about another 300. And then we have cases that uh, we've been able to identify in other um, existing studies uh, with either with OCD or with tick disorders. And that's about a hundred of those that already exist. And these are cases that have genetic data now. And then um, in the, if people have heard of the All of Us study um, uh, in the biobank at, at MGH, there are another about 400 individuals who may not be that well characterized, but they can sort of provide data to interpret the uh, some of the genetics that comes out of BPMI, and so which is what's so important about BPMI is that um, you may be able to build power and strength to identify genetic information using less well characterized um, uh, infra, uh, subjects with only with the, just the primary diagnosis, but then you can use that. Um, to then go into the BPMI samples where there's just such in-depth information. So as of right now, we have a little bit over a thousand cases, and that is what's um, in the process of being um, analyzed. Uh, I, we actually, the last set of the uh, of these symbols have, have been sent to the Broad Institute and are going to be genotyped over the next month or two, or, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that. We have to hear from them. Um, so that we'll, uh, we should be in a, in a good position to analyze, uh, analyze these and understand what we, you know, and understand what we have. Um, and I understand that with regard to the analyses, um, I know for people with, you know, wondering where the results are from BPMI, that COVID basically shut down all of these labs because this is all in-person work right. for quite yeah. a long time, a year or even longer. No, two. It was two. Years. Two, so it was two years. Yeah. Two, two years because not only did it shut us down, but then, but then these labs uh, switched over to uh, and all of their sequencing machines to sequence COVID, um, and and all the all the pipettes and all the tubes and everything to essentially um, do testing. Um, and now they are now they are they are back up and running more just because they've built the ability to do both. Mm -hmm. But that yeah that really set things back for a good two years. Um, but we are, they are back up and running. Right. Yeah. So that's sort of where I wanted to be. Yep. So I have a couple of questions. I thought maybe we could, we could go into a little more um, discussion of some of these topics, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And then I know there, there are a couple of questions and comments coming in. And so we can open it up. If people have questions or comments, they can, um, 
they go ahead and enter them in the Q&A function, preferably. I mean, if you, we can also look at some in the chat as well. But um, my understanding, and I'm not a geneticist, but I've, you know, I've, I've been to many meetings with you and listened to you talk and, and others, um, you know, in looking at OCD and Tourette's and BFRBs and all is that, you know, finding an Eiffel Tower is you still need thousands and thousands of cases. That's right. Perhaps. That's right. Looking for, you know, a house on 34th and Elm Street in Boston, which might be a little closer to um, what we're doing with Trick, you clearly need many, many, many more cases. Is that is that an accurate way of saying it? Or, or no. uh, well, you know, it really, <laughs> uh, uh, no matter what, it really it's a numbers game. Mm -hmm. It's still going to require a lot of numbers because while one can find um, these large effect genes, by definition, those are very rare. And the reason they're rare is because they usually uh, cause major changes in the body or the brain. And uh, and so those may be only present in one in a thousand people. And yet you need to find at least two or three of them um, uh, to know that that is definitively um, a risk gene for, for trick. So you're talking about still needing at least a few thousand to do that. The, the Boston sort of landscape concept of what, um, even if the individual genetic factors are uh, have have smaller effects, they uh, uh, they're common. These are variations that all of us have that that exist between five and fifty percent of the population. So, you know, uh, there literally is a little bit of of trichotillomania or tick disorder or depression or any of these things in all of us, right? This is like, these are, these are, these are traits that we have more or less of probably through most of the, uh, of humanity. Um, and so it's really trying to leverage that information. And so there's just different ways to do that. Um, okay, well, that's, that's uh, very, that's very helpful. Um, I appreciate yeah. you asking me. Um, I have one more question for you. I wanna switch gears a little bit and then, yeah. and then open it up because there's a lot of questions coming in. It's really cool yeah. that a lot of the questions are, um, Ask, actually interested in some of the scientific aspects of this. So I, I sure. think we have a really a really educated or highly informed group watching today, which is just is fantastic. Um, and this is, you know, in our clinic when we when we do psychoeducation about BFRBs or or the related disorders. Yeah. Um, and we talk about the fact that there is a genetic, certainly there's a biological underpinning to these disorders, and there's a genetic, some genetic involvement as well. Um, and families, you know, we have families, somebody say, well, is it my fault or what can I do or did I cause this? How do you, how do you respond to that? I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but I can Yeah, but it's a great, it's a great, it's a great question because, you know, gene the, our interpretations of what genetics mean, um, um, you know, one of the reasons I was interested in genetics in, in, um, in these areas is actually the opposite, right? You know, um, this is not, this is not just uh, uh, I, I did something, you know, that happened to me or I had some conversation, I mean, you know, not really that way, but this is something that is, that is not have some sort of biology behind it. It does. But I think the important piece here to understand is, um, uh, there is in many cases, what, what many of what many of these genes um, may actually be doing is in some ways uh, setting up the brain circuitry that is associated with this, or maybe the response to certain uh, neurotransmitters. So um, it, it is, it sort of may, sets up the hardware in our brain that then um, may influence how the software, our thoughts and other these things uh, work. I, what I thought you were going to ask, maybe, which I think is also as important, is just because this is genetic, that doesn't mean that things like behavioral therapy can't treat it because 
you don't necess- you don't need to necessarily have a drug treat something that has a genetic influence, um, particularly if it, you're talking about um, uh, something that's going on in our brains, which are responsive to internal and external influences. Um, and people have actually demonstrated, I think you, you've done a, a good amount of work in, in this area, not with genetics, but just showing how after behavioral therapy, you can actually have changes in activity and things like this that people consider biological. So I, I don't think, I don't want us to, to think that just because it's genetic, therefore we need to have a drug that's gonna make, the, that's gonna do it. Um, yeah. um, um, that that said, one key about finding a gene, even if it only you know is found in a few people, if that teaches us biology and leads us to a drug um, that you know might be less that might have fewer side effects, and it could be options for people for, who aren't able to access um, uh, the types of behavior treatments they can have. So that's that's also another reason we we certainly would like to be able to do that, but that's gonna that will take time. Okay. All you know, people don't realize all behavior is biological. If we didn't have a brain, we couldn't do anything. So anything to change behavior, by definition, has to involve the brain or change the brain in some. That's right. Exactly. Um, a couple of questions here. Some great questions. The first one um, is from Susan. Is overlap of genetic predisposition taken into consideration when experts decide what disorders to group together in DSM? Is that one of the mm-hmm. reasons why the IDs came together? <laughs> Um, so I'm, I haven't been on that committee, but I, 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 um, uh, I don't know whether that does. I mean, it, it, I, there's, I think people are certainly thinking about brain systems that, that, that may overlap and work together. Um, but there are also other, uh, other factors, um, when professional opinions come together. So for example, my, my own bias, um, um, I work a lot on um, individuals with tics, with tic disorders, where about 30 to 60% have OCD. I think tic disorders should be in that classification of OCRDs, but someone just decided, wait, uh, there are neurodevelopmental conditions and this that's a neurologic condition. So it should be in the same category as autism and not be in the OCRDs. when because we don't really think about the multidimensionality of, of how our brains work. But that's a good question. I, um, I don't know if do you have, an, a, do you yourself, John, have a, an understanding of, of when, those, when the I, DSM committee was there? Um, I wasn't part of that committee, but I know talking to people, and I think it goes back to what you were saying about the genetics may set the hardware. So you may be genetically predisposed to be more impulsive than average or less tolerant of negative feelings than average. And we know these are both implicated in, in BFRBs. They're also implicated in anxiety and depression and Correct. OCD. So Correct. there's a lot of commonality across these disorders. I think, I, I, I agree that ticks, I think BFRBs and, and ticks are a little similar. Yeah. And um, I, yeah, I'm, I, I don't think I would have done it the way that it has been done, but maybe that's a, that's a, Discussion for another <laughs> another day. No, absolutely. Yeah, uh, 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 I think absolutely. So there are a lot of factors that go into it. It may be that that people, you know, if there's high co, I think probably it's that there's high co-occurrence between the OCRDs, and there's also thought to be similar biology, and those things also correlate well with whether there are shared genetic factors, even if we don't know what they all are. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, the next question is a little bit simpler, but my, I don't think the answer is, I think the answer may be even more complicated. Um, from Natalie, are BFRB genes dominant or recessive? So that's that's an awesome question. So um, uh, so we, we, we tend to use the term dominant and recessive when, first of all, that's for an individual gene. And um, uh, and so for what we call these single gene disorders, our Mendelian disorders, it's really important whether they're dominant or recessive. Um, this, may, this may sort of be a little bit um, uh, adding another dimension to it, but if, we're, if, 
what we actually think that these individual factors for complex disease is that each of the contributors themselves could be either dominant or recessive, and they each add a small amount of risk, two or threefold, and then you add them together. And right now we think of them as additive just because that's the most simple way of doing that. And so um, it's very hard actually to recognize, to identify a recessive small effect size factor. So most people are just thinking of them of, as additive, where if you have one, one copy of it that's changed, you go up by X amount, 1.5. And if you, if you have two copies that are changed, it goes up, it's, it's additive. So it's be, you know, a total of three, um, threefold. But many of these are like 1.2. And then you go up to like 1.4. Um, it's, it's, these are really small effects. I, I think I see that Jen came on because so I think I got a little too wonky there. So my apologies. No, um, no worries, Jeremiah. I think that John. Oh, there we, he is. Oh, we so lost John. Lost okay. For a second, okay. He's back. Okay. Yeah, I, I was yeah. in. I was in the ether for a while. I, uh, okay. I know that John likes statistics a lot, so so I won't take that personally. I don't think that he got wonked out because he's he knows more statistics than I do. Uh -oh. Yeah. Sorry about sorry about that. Um, That's okay. No problem. Excited to hear this. Um, the next question is uh, from Emily Olson, whose research that you um, cited, um, Emily is the um, funded to do some genetics research on BFRBs at, uh, at Yale and a, an amazing, amazing um, up and coming scientist that we're very excited to have part of this community. Um, um, I think it'll be interesting to see if the thousand BFRB samples have higher PRS scores for OCD ticks and other related disorders. I think that beyond Gene discovery, the data can teach us about the shared genetic architecture of these conditions in a more fine-tuned manner than previously possible. I'm very excited about the data and looking forward to seeing what we find in BPMS. So what are PRS scores? Yeah, so this is, it's a great question. So what, so what, what people have learned that you can do um, is that, that even, let's say, for example, let's say there might be 400 genes that contribute, um, you can actually take, uh, again, this is done experimentally. There's only a couple of conditions where this is now done clinically, where you can see if each person in some study have how many of those 400 gene variants do they have in the risk in the pushing towards, uh, towards having a BFRB. So of those 400, someone with more, with severe disease might have all 400 going up in that direction. And some people that might have mild disease, however you happen to decide what that is, might only have 20. Um, in reality, it's probably more than 400, but that's what gives us, that's what we think may give us the, the continuity of what we see over, over uh, you know, humanity. Um, we have more evidence for these, you know, for conditions that are studied a, a little bit more, uh, more often, meaning o like OCD, um, and also for ticks, uh, for Tourette syndrome and related tick disorders, that individuals with, let's say, um, more severe OCD may have a higher number in the risk uh, 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 category. Um, uh, so that's, we may, those are experiments that one certainly wants to do. And I know that, for example, in BPMI, there's going to be a goal of trying to see whether those correlate with imaging information with other type, I mean, all the things that, that the different investigators are going to be interested um, in looking at. Um, what I should say is that this is not just science fiction. Um, in conditions that actually are studied in hundreds of thousands of people, like cardiac disease, there has been research that now is demonstrated and is used clinically that, um, uh, that you can identify uh, someone with a knockout gene in a disease that causes um, early heart disease um, in about uh, one in 100 people. But you can find one in 40 people that have a polygenic risk score and additives of the number of these a small effect genes in about one in 40. And they're now using that, at least here at Mass General, for diagnostics for people with high familial risk of sudden cardiac death or of uh, high cholesterol or cardiac or uh, coronary artery disease. Now that has an enormous amount of funding, but it shows you, you know, it, 
whatever the underlying genetic basis of these conditions are, you can still get there to a, eventually to a place that you could use clinically. But but that's 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 going to be far ahead. Yeah, and um, I think that, I'm sorry. I think we're out of time. But one more comment and conversations that we've had. When you look at these studies of hundreds of thousands, or schizophrenia now has you know yeah. tens tens of thousands, even OCD, yeah, have huge studies. We can go now with our data because we also have in BPMI and all of these, we know we have diagnoses of they have OCD or Tourette's or depression or anxiety. So we right. can go to the anxiety, you know, genetics people with their 20,000 cases and say, can we share with you? And did you happen to like ask about Tourette's or, or, or trichotillomania, right? So right, that, right, that's right. And and maybe if we leave with something, it's a this is about advocacy. It's about whether people are asking those questions in their clinics about from people who don't necessarily come for, for trichotillomania in the first place. The more, the more there's awareness internationally among doctors, among researchers, that, that hair pulling and skin picking is an important thing to be asking patients about and getting in registries of general health. Um, that's how people have ended up with these hundreds of thousands of things you know, get, getting, trying to get the CDC to, to ask those questions of every American, you know, other things like that. If, if people are asking those, then they get picked up by these general genetic screens for health. And that's really what has made a huge difference in the last five years for these other disorders. So you may think it's, wow, this is this genetic stuff, but, but really the public policy uh, and advocacy of getting these recognized is how you get into them in the first place, uh, on these lists. And that's where, that's where the genetics is going to benefit the most from. So keep on doing whatever you guys are doing for advocacy because that's going to make a big difference. That's fantastic. And we have one final question. I know we're really um, we're actually running a minute over, but this is a really, really important question. Why does trichotillomania for hair pulling present itself at different ages? All of a sudden, a five-year-old child pulls eyelashes or eyebrows, or all of a sudden it may start at age 17. Is that related to genetics? I don't know. What do you think? I'm not sure either. Boy, I wish I did know the answer. Yeah, um, you know, there, there certainly are. Um, this is this is a, it, it's a question that we had. You know, this is a great question that we that we really just need some actual, you know, what what we call empirical data. You know, something that we can test. For OCD, people are certainly have been look. You know, want to look at is OCD that onsets in childhood somehow have a higher genetic burden than OCD that goes in adulthood. And people haven't really gotten a great answer from that yet, but maybe they will soon. Those are great, you know, those are hypotheses that then we need data to test. And I, and I certainly don't know the answer. That doesn't mean that there isn't, aren't very good hypotheses. Um, I, but it may be that I think with some disorders, you might be born with like a, a an additional risk, like maybe you're a little more impulsive or a little bit more this or a little bit more that. And for some kids, it's strong enough that it pops early in life. Mm -hmm. others, maybe you need to go through life experiences or some things have to change or mature or develop, but it's just hi completely hypothetical. We really yeah, don't know. But and this is what the next generation of research is gonna need, right? So if there are people here who are interested in doing that and pursuing the sciences, you know, down the road, that's like, you know, when, when I'm, you know, when I'm retired and I mean, or even before, but, but even, you know, when people take over future things, we're going to have so many more tools than we never thought of. And people are going to have to ask those questions. And the best, the best research comes from questions that people ask like you, you know, clinical Absolutely. observations that we see in clinic or a family or somebody, or even something like this question, Absolutely. keep them coming because that's, that's what gives us our ideas. We're, we're not as smart as you think. We, we rely on all of you to teach us what we need to be looking for and what we need to be doing. And I think we are done here. Um, thank you very much, Jeremiah. Oh, thank you. Well, I think that's a great place to pause um, because I'm sure we'll continue this conversation again at some point in the future. We just wanna thank you both so very much on behalf of PLC for being here, for lending your time and expertise, for doing the work that you're doing for this community. I know it's a labor of love and it just takes time. And so, Thank you for continuing to push forward to try to find more information about how to best support our community. It's very, very much appreciated. To the TLC staff for hanging in there this entire week and putting on an amazing BFRB Awareness Week. Thank you so much. 
we have a couple more events to go. Thank you guys, much appreciated. To all of you for being here today, thank you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for tuning in. This is a, such an important conversation. Don't forget to help us by completing the post-event survey, which is now linked in the chat. And many of you I have seen on these calls before, and so you know the drill. Completing this post-event survey enters you into the drawing for a BFRB Brave Box valued at over $150. We'll be making the big announcement tomorrow at the BFRB Brave Bash of who has been chosen to receive those. So you won't want to miss that too. The link for the BFRB Brave Bash live stream fundraising concert is now in the chat. Ticket starts at $25 and it's tomorrow at 4 p.m. And then finally, it's not too late to wear your BFRB pride. I think I'm going to get some for Dr. Scharf and Dr. Passantini. Every order that you uh, make through Bonfire gives us 10% back to TLC to do exactly this, provide health education programs that make a difference for our community. So the link is now in the chat, get some merch and it benefits all of us. Thanks again for joining us. We wish you a very happy afternoon and we'll see you back here tomorrow for the last bit of BFRB Awareness Week. Thanks everyone.